Good morning. Hello, São Paulo, Brazil. Yes, my Good dear morning. friend. Good morning. Bom dia. It's such a difference. So it's such a difference going from Scotland to Brazil. Uh, you know, I can just tell you a big Not difference. Not really. So it's warmer. And I, and I recognize the man on your, on, on your right uh, is uh, Professor Grube. Exactly. Yes. And yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Of course, Ebahar and I are a little bit nervous to be moderated by two very powerful women, Roxana and Cindy. Cindy, there, Rox? <laughs> I'm here. Yes, oh, I'm here for you, Alex. wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm Alexis Beckup. <laughs> Listen, so uh, uh, it's a pleasure for us. I will make some uh, quick introductions from the team here in Sao Paulo. Uh, needless to any introduction, of course, my friend, the guest operator today, Ebaha Grube, who have been working with <coughs> us for many, many years. Uh, Hibamar Costa, who really was the one that prepared very carefully the, this patient. And our two fellows from first and second year, Abel and Bruno. Very strong tier, team here, Galo to back us up, and the uh, anesthesiologist Alexander, and a great team of uh, nurse and techs. Uh, by, uh, to read our OCT Fantastic. and our... We have an amazing panel here. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me, let me I want to hear. You, we have a huge panel here. Dr. Rocha Alame, Dr. Mauro Carlino, Dr. Hector Garcia, Dr. Philippe Gaspar, Dr. Kerry Kimmelson, Dr. Magnus Oman, Dr. Peter Smith, Dr. Mohamed Subhi, Dr. Marco Valzumigli, Dr. Pascal Ranch, and Dr. Bonnie Wiener. And of course, the one and only Dr. Cindy Grimes. So Wonderful. Very, very eclectic team to help us to discuss through this uh, case. And of course, this is going to be a lot of imaging. So we also invite uh, Daniel Chamier to help us to interpret some of the image. Uh, uh, Jose, can you please go ahead and present the case? Of course. Do you have the slides on the screen, please? Okay, uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Roxana, good morning, everybody. This is a case of a 58-year-old gentleman who, uh, who has uh, a bunch of risk factors for coronary artery disease. The most important is the type 2 diabetes. And this gentleman presented to another service uh, three years ago uh, with uh, -ST, uh, ST elevation MI, an inferior wall ST elevation MI, and was treated with primary PCI to the RCA with a second generation drug eluting stent at the time, three years ago. And now he came to our institution with a complaint of stable angina, CCS3, and uh, shortness of breath. He underwent a, a stress test with a scintigraphy that was positive for ischemia in the inferior, inferior wall, moderate ischemia. His LV function globally was mild, there was a mild dysfunction mostly at the inferior wall, but with ischemia and uh, no necrosis. Next slide, please. We did his angiography uh, a week ago. As you can see here, the left, sir, the left system, the left coronary artery, the, 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 there is no disease in the left main. There's a short left main. The circ is a good caliber circ with diffuse but non-obstructive disease. And next slide, please. As you appreciate, it's difficult to see in this view, but in the still picture, the next slide, please, there is a moderate, a 50% stenosis in the middle AD. Next, please. You can see in another view, in the left cranial view. Next, please. There is this mid moderate stenosis in the middle AD. Next. And we observed a focal Restenosis in a large dominant RCA. As I mentioned before, this is a stand that was implanted three years ago, a drug eluting stand. Next, please. It's very focal. Next. In a huge vessel. We don't usually expect to see uh, restenosis in large vessels treated with drug eluting stands. Next, please. Next. And the LV function globally is preserved, just a mild dysfunction in the fear wall. Next, please. <coughs> and this is uh, the summary of the case, a stable angina patient with positive stress test. And we plan to do some physiological assessment of LAD intermediate lesion, and do some invasive assessment of the ISR mechanism in the RCA, and do uh, OCT-guided ISR treatment with drug eluting balloon. That's the plan for today. So, so this is the case, Roxana. 
Do you want to go ahead and, and interrogate the panel or any comment? Yeah, can, uh, I, yeah. can I just make a, make a comment? Uh, Rox and, and Cindy, what you can see here, without knowing anything about imaging and what's going to happen um, in, the, in the next uh, steps, you can see this is a big, big, big vessel. And uh, normally, you know, I would suspect that the cause of restenosis, that's pure speculation from my side, usually when you see something like that, you know, the initial result, you put a 3.5 in, blow it up, and then that's it. My suspicion is, or would be, that the, <clears throat> I don't know whether that's the cause, but at least we would see an underexpanded stent in this situation. Because yeah. it's a big vessel, mm. I don't know what the diameter is, but I think it will be four. So, Rox, do, do you want to ask the panel if they, they, they would recommend imaging in all cases with ISR to understand the mechanism yeah, so, and how we treat? So, so no, a really, really good uh, case in stent restenosis. We're starting to see it more and more, actually. We're, uh, this is not a rare condition. We're seeing it a, a lot less than what we were seeing in bare stents. Would anyone, I mean, most people, to be honest, is the sad news is that most people would just do this without imaging. Uh, but I would say that uh, this is, would be the absolute the wrong way. Uh, Magnus, you have some, something to uh, yeah, say? Yeah, I, I, I would say thing? that in, in the way this patient initially presented, he presented in a STEMI. We know that vessels in young patients are vasoconstricted in STEMI. So it's very natural, and I'm not blaming the prior operator, to undersize the stent. That's right. So I think, that's I think Dr. Gruber is absolutely right. I think if you do this without, IVUS or imaging, you will actually n not really know what you're dealing with. So I think it's absolutely essential. Well, I think it's essential in every case of restenosis or stent thrombosis, for sure, to do an IVUS. But we looked at, I mean, there's occasional cases where it's very undersized if you don't give lots Left of nitro the in the setting of a STEMI. But if you look at the MLDs of the normal segments in the various trials, they're pretty similar uh, for the pre- and post angiographic follow-up. So I think the average case is probably okay. It's just there's these unusual cases where there could be diffuse vasoconstriction. Yeah, I... Uh, the, you know, this is in the era gone by. This would be a typical location for stretch fraction. And I think IBIS can help you to see if that is the mechanism. But I agree, you need to image in every recent open yeah. in their DM. So we can say it could be stress fracture, it could be undersized, underexpanded stent, it could be neoatherosclerosis. It's been a couple of years. So so, yeah. so it could be a lot of things. Without imaging, we would never know. So Any Rox, other thoughts? So let's see. You got the imaging for us? So, we so can uh, Rox, it? which, no, which no, imaging would you, would you prefer? Would you do a OCT or IVUS? So very good question. Um, uh, Hector? Uh, I would go for OCT, but OCT. Uh, I would certainly would be very informative as well. Yeah. Uh, I would not have any particular preference for any of the two in this particular situation, but I would have... Uh, slightly more inclined to use OCT. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think the, the important thing is it's what you're used to and what you have available to with, with and what you're most comfortable with in interpreting the image. The worst thing right. you can do is to use imaging technology you're unfamiliar with and making the wrong uh, mm -hmm. choices or diagnoses. So, you're Bonnie? Right. Yeah, I think the other point to make out here, although we're focusing on the focal area approximately in the, the whole thing is if you look at the, the angiogram, there's diffuse disease in this Absolutely. whole Absolutely, I, I noticed that as well. Yes, and very, very good. And again, another reason why imaging is so important. Uh, Marco Valdemigli, IVIS or OCT, and then we'll see what they chose. I agree with what has been said. Probably I would have a preference for OCT, but I think IVIS can be informative. And here you don't not need to do any physiological assessment. If anything, no invasive testing is really speaking for ischemia. So you just image the vessel and understand how that should be treated. Yeah. Peter? Mm -hmm. I have no specific preference. I think both would be very helpful. Um, um, and I certainly also believe that under deployment or an, um, is, an, is in fact you can see the ectatic vessel distally, so probably it's already proximal as well. So, so the great news is that at Dante Pazanese we have experts in IVIS and OCT, but I know that both modalities are used. But in a case like this, I would like to see more, and I'm thinking that OCT is the way to go. So let me see what you did. Wonderful. So provision, provision, provision. We knew it, Rox. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it. And, uh, that's why we have OCT. So, so be, yes, before we show the OCT uh, of the RCA, which is really the corporate vessel here, uh, we have to take out of our way that intermediate lesion in the uh, LAD. 
So I will ask uh, Danielle to describe, and if you can show the image, we decided to go for a non-invasive FFR with the so-called QFR, uh, and then uh, Danielle we will describe uh, some words about this technology and show the images that we acquired investigating the LAD. Can we have the images? Remember, there were intermediate yeah, lesions, right? Yeah. QFR on. So QFR is, um, is an invasive but, but wireless FFR derived from two angiographic yeah, views that you acquire yeah. on a basic angiogram. The only thing you need is nitroglycerin <laughs> administered prior to the angio, and the two projections has to be at least 25 degrees apart from each other. So based on that, you reconstruct a, t a 3D model of the vessel and through very sophisticated CFD models, you predict what will be the, the FFR for the vessel. So you will see mm. in this image that we have at least three focal what, lesions what, what in a vessel that, that is more towards a diffusely diseased vessel. So in the mid lesion, we have a, a very focal stenosis that gives us a, a gradient of 0.12 uh, units of QFR. And based on that, for the total vessel, we have a 0.84, which would be well above the 0.80 threshold, if you will, for uh, the dichotomic uh, cutoff. But towards this diffuse nature and a very focal and small gradient towards the most significant lesion, we decided not to do anything with the LED and proceed to the invasive imaging of the RCA. Can, so, can I ask, uh, Daniel, how sure. comfortable are you using QFR and a kind of extrapolative technique versus using invasive physiology? Where we're quite near to the cutoff here, and I would worry that perhaps the accuracy of the technique at this point is maybe not as good as at the extremes of the spectrum. Yeah, you're right. So, so that's, a, that's a good question. So how, how confident are you uh, with QFR in this situation? But I, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm more confident because the stress test didn't show exactly. anterior wall ischemia. So this is kind of going along with what they had seen on the stress test. And I think it's a nice non-invasive way to look at the LAD as you're seeing the angiogram to uh, stop you from moving forward because there was no ischemia there. Any other? Um, well, and then the tightest lesion is quite focal also, because in general, uh, the more focal the lesion, the less likely it is for the IFR or FFR to be abnormal. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're, we're building any, up our experience on QFR. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, so what we know about this technology is... It would be really nice if you actually did IFR there, and so for us to just validate your QFR and your stress test, it would have been fun. but. But uh, we'll go to your OCT and talk about that later because we, do, we, we don't want to miss the whole sure. yeah. case. Sure. Exactly. The focus here is not that. Of course, there are some validation studies, but you're absolutely right. I think that the ischemia was in the inferior wall by uh, nuclear medicine. This is just a nice illustration to confirm that we're not going to touch the LAD. Uh, but now I think we're going to go back to Danielle so he can show us the OCT images of the RCA. And let's see if Eberhard was right about the underexpansion. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can have the OCT on the screen. Well, I, I think, I think Bonnie, Bonnie is, thinks that there's going to be diffuse disease, especially distal to the focal stenosis, and there's going to be this focal, uh, probably underexpansion of the, throughout the stent, uh, according to the, to the size, and then especially right at the lesion. So let's see what the OCT shows. Well, the stent, the stent fracture thing is also interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, because it's not mentioned that new atherosclerosis and then the end expansion, so... That's right. Yeah, yeah. so we have a okay. very... Uh, it's difficult to say anything after a very ex expert panel, and all predictions are correct. So I, I marked here we have about 31 millimeters of a stent, which was implanted in 2016, so three years ago. And as you can see, I'm going to play it before, and, and as you can see, a very smooth and small NIH in the distal part, and as we come to the midsection of the stent, you'll see a, a catch-up of NIH, a little bit more, areas of under-expansion, and I'll go back that, to that region later. And here we have a very focal restenosis here, and again, coming to the proximal edge. So the mechanism is an a under-deployed stent, as you can appreciate here, for example, Still, three years later, we have some malopause struts that never healed over time. You see a completely uncovered struts three years after the, the deployment, which is kind of unexpected in wow. this segment. 
as we can see also here. And um, the mean stent area that we measured was about 3.5. I'm going to show you the measure. Area or diameter? The diameters, I'm sorry. So the diameters we got for the stent were about 3.5 in the midsection. And in a 4.5 millimeter vessel, right? So yes. that's why you say so it's under and, and, But the vessel, when we have the area, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about lumen here. When you look at the lumen diameter, it's about 4.5, uh, 4.6. So it's uh, significantly underdeployed stent in this big vessel. If you look at the very distal part of the vessel, actually the vessel comes close to 5. It's 4.8, which is not our target there. When we look at the MLA region, and then we're going to take a look more carefully to the NIH pattern, and you will see. So people usually call this as a layered NIH, which I personally don't like much. And uh, it's layered just because the NIH is very thick, and you don't have much intensity of light to go through it. But one thing that calls our attention is this pattern that you see here, these dark shadows that are very sharp. And in contrast to lipid, these are shadows created by these focal, uh, you know, bright dots here in the NIH, which are inflammatory markers or macrophage infiltration here. So there is a, some signs of new atherosclerosis, more due to infl inflammatory accumulation here, due to macrophage infiltration that comes and shadows, cast shadows on the vessel behind. So Great. it's a mix of underdeployment and some new atherosclerosis findings. No fracture. So rock. No, no so fracture, right? Yeah. You don't Under see any fracture. neoatherosclerosis and uh, a, a, a neoentomal hyperplasia growth. So I have a question, because I can't really tell the stent expansion at the plane of the neoatherosclerosis, but the other segments, they haven't thrombosed in, in two years. Two years. I, uh, I think Gary Mintz showed that uh, late uh, stent malapposition, other than in the tax, the stent really was meaningless. And so I'd probably leave those uh, other struts alone and focus right on the uh, restenotic area. Mm -hmm. And in the restenotic area, I, could you tell us how large, I can't tell how the stent expansion looks. Huh. It looks so, I think from his um, measurements, and I could be wrong, please let us know. That the, 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 the stent throughout, it's not just at the focal area, that throughout the stent, it's really undersized yes. for the, the vessel. But it's well, it's, yeah, that but it's might be true, but it's a, it's a five millimeter vessel. And yeah. I guess at this point, how much injury do you want to do without covering? Again, it's a, it's yeah. a problem with uh, injuring but not covering it with another drug eluding stent. I'm a little concerned about that. Pascal? Uh, I have a question. Uh, to what extent is the, the fact that the stent was underexposed and was creating an area of low shear stress was causing the fact that post stent, a uh, post area, there is the neoatherosclerosis. So the low shear stress creating the inflammatory status and from there on creating the plaque that is forming again. Yeah, I think Pascal, uh, you made a very good comment. Um, and I want to elaborate, so uh, Markova, Jimigli, and myself are looking at the OCT of the OCT matrix, and 55% of the STEMI population that were looked with OCT after the primary PCI have underexpansion of the stem. Yeah. Why? Because we are in a very vastly constricted vessel. But I want to ask Daniel, so at the location of the, uh, this exuberant neointimal growth, mm -hmm. uh, I need some strats, so I want to cast it out here whether we would not have, a, it's, it's right there in that sector, so from nine to six, I miss, it could be because the new intimate is so thick yeah. that you don't see them, but I would maybe consider a partial fracture at the location of the new intima. You see no. there from seven to four, yeah. you have the shadow of the wire there, but I'm missing some struts in the circumference. If you, if, if you can follow my mouse, actor, you'll see the, the struts are visible. You, see, you have one here, then you have the shadow by the wire, and you have another one here around three, four. Yeah. I don't think it's seven, really think so, eight, no. There is no fracture. Nine. Uh, I don't think we have fracture. One usable tool would be a 3D reconstruction. There, there. Show me the struts there. Show me the struts there from nine. Yeah, but 
you know, this is just... Okay, we can't hear uh, you if you don't put your thing. You see here, so we have struts here. So from and 9 to 4, he doesn't see yeah, it. Yeah, I don't see any struts from 9 know to 4. I'm just there from throwing nine that to out. Four. I think it's a multifactorial um, risk. I mean, the ISR is multifactorial. It's definitely all what we have been discussing, but I miss to see some struts in some sectors of the circumference, not yeah. constantly, yes. but certainly there. But I'm also yeah. saying maybe the thickness of the new Intima doesn't allow us to and, see that. And, yeah, and it has to do with the design. It has to, do, to figure it out. It has to do with the design of the stand. You see in just so, one so cross section. So is suggesting if you really want to make a strut <laughs> fracture diagnosis, that IVIS would be uh, a good way. But I, I guess the important question is, would your treatment approach change if you had seen um, a strut fracture as opposed to neointimal tissue? And if not, yeah. at the moment, we're seeing an underexpanded stent as yes. a major causation of this right. with some neoatherosclerosis. Yeah. And your plan is to go in with a drug-eluting balloon. Well, so we're going to hear about your drug-eluting balloon. Hopefully, the, that's going to go up on the factoid so we could see it. Yeah. Uh, I think you're, you said Rock you were going to use magic touch. Uh, but more importantly, I think, because uh, as we're learning more and more, is that do we think, do we need another layer of a stent yeah. in, in, in a case like this? We certainly in the United States do not have access yeah. to any of these balloons, but the magic touch is a serolimus drug, uh, drug uh, uh, coated balloon where the serolimus is encapsulated in these a yes. biocompatible excipient matrix, and it's an interesting balloon. We're waiting to hear some of the results, and you're going to tell us about it. Mohamed Sofi. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, we have knowledge now from new atherosclerosis stents under expansion, so this is a combination between mechanical and biological factors. Yeah. This is called type 3, and this type 3, I push a balloon with either drug with balloon first, if there is no response, good stent. But if you have a stent fracture, no drug with balloon. You have to make a stent. So yeah, I, I don't think we can claim strut fracture in this case. We have only one cross section where we just don't have any visible struts in this section here. If you move one frame proximal, you have struts. You go one down, you have yeah. struts. I, I, I think this has more to do with the design of the stand and the neointimal thickness than to, to be yeah. really sure about strut fracture here. It's always an option and you ha have to look after that, but I don't think we can claim we have strut fracture in this case. Thank you so much for the discussion, but we have to move uh, ahead with the, the case. Yes, please. Because uh, time is, is, is running short and we have one more case to show. So I, I guess that the next discussion yeah. is how do we prepare this lesion? Uh, we debate a lot with Ebahar. I think he has strong feelings that uh, we should use some kind of so the bulky. Well, I mean, I think the lesion preparation here, I mean, we have new intima, uh, and then I, I can at least in part well, disagree with this, the partial or stent fracture situation here. Um, he has looked at it carefully, and uh, I, I think based on that, we can exclude that. So we're focusing on the new intimate situation. There is tissue there. The question is, how do you treat in order to get an optimal balloon result if you use the drag coated balloon? I think we have various options. You could do the scoring balloon. You can de maybe even think of shockwave uh, using something like that. Um, yes. you know, but I think the lesion preparation here is important in order to get the optimal, uh, the optimal um, uh, situation uh, for the optimal condition for a drug eluding balloon. I don't think that the balloon alone will probably be able to that just squeeze the stuff aside and would be enough. Any thoughts from your side? Uh, uh, yeah, as we discussed, I'm no, just going to go ahead, Roxana, so with uh, predilatation. Okay, with uh, yeah, cutting so balloon. I fully agree. I think, you know, yeah, I see that you're, uh, this is a cutting balloon. Is it a 4 yeah. cutting balloon? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. it's a 4 -o. What's the size of this cutting balloon? 4, -o four -o. 10. 4 by 10. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a great no, technique so here to here. avoid uh, injury sites that we're not going to touch with... Uh, DCB, so I think you see, you don't see that watermelon seed effect. It goes very uh, stable for the post dilatation. 12 atmospheres, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But this really shows you the need for uh, pre uh, preparation of yes. this lesion yeah. Yeah. for the treatment with the drug coated. Yeah. Your, your, your point is so well taken. Eva Hart. Um, I mean, I just saw there was a it was a while before the the balloon fully expanded here, yeah. Yeah. and that's with a uh, cutting balloon. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think you're right. Thank you, I think the lesion. Any comments from anyone on the panel? 
Russia? Much no, better. I mean, I was going to comment earlier just about the heavy lo load of kind of NIH that definitely is scoring or cutting balloon would be your sort of preparation of choice. It's interesting that it went down so easily because often we find that they're quite bulky and hard to go down fusions like this, but actually this was pretty smooth. Alex, while you were there, are you, I, you didn't go down to pre... Uh, are you just... Uh, are you going to treat the entire stent length? No, no. Dr. Uh, Dr. No. Miran, uh, we decided to... Our strategy was similar to what Dr. St. Grimes proposed. That we, despite the stent is overall underexpanded, after three years, there is very little hyperplasia in the other segments. So, yeah. as we plan to do DEB, we are just going to concentrate on the more diseased area and we plan to do a short therapy, a focal therapy, not cover all the segments, just yeah. the, the ISR area. Yeah, and, right. and that was Cindy's point before she left. She yeah. had to leave, unfortunately, but the point was why injure the entire vessel that's quiescent, especially even you know, it's underdilated, but it's quiescent. And, for the last couple yeah. of years, so um, we understand and we see that. Yeah, so the discussion now. So now but, what but, do you have? But, so yeah. while, while, while he's working, uh, Rox, I, I get the point that in the acute MI, the vessel is undersized, but shouldn't, on the other hand, you know, shouldn't we try um, looking at the, at the post-implant in acute MI situation, post-implant uh, with IVIS, because with IVIS you would definitely see that you know the stent is under you know under expanded. You can't put a 3.5 in a 5.0 vessel. I mean, you can. You have to maybe uh, right. if it's not you know if other stents are not available. But at least you know, and you can maybe try everything possible to dilate it even further. You know, yeah. I think the imaging post is important, particularly in big vessels. So our strategy here. So um, tell us what you got there now. Yeah. So we 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 pretreated with a cutting balloon up to 12 atmospheres of 4.0. Now we are going to a non-compliant balloon 4.5, really to optimize the result, ex expand this, the previous stent well, and take care of the perhaps some residual stenosis. The next uh, discussion, Roxana, is what kind of result with balloon we can leave to go ahead with a drug eluting balloon. The, by definition, we shouldn't uh, leave le more than 30% residual stenosis. And this is what the protocol that we use for this uh, particular device says. So this is our goal here. Let's see how, how it looks after both. Oh, the balloon is, the, the, I have to fix the, the catheter. The catheter. Yeah, to fix the guy. Yeah, but, but this is again the combination of uh, cutting. This time, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's see if, you, if this is acceptable. Yeah. I think you have a big lumen there. Yeah, it is a big lumen. Everybody happy with that lumen? Alex, are you going to do OTT before doing tracosis balloon? Or yeah. I, I was going to ask that same question. Yeah. We want to see the second case, so please yeah. don't do OTT. So, so, because we have okay, to so one. <laughs> Yeah. Funny, though, because your eye now gets drawn to that area, this in the mid sense, isn't it? Yeah. And it suddenly looks a bit worse. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I think the other thing to bear in mind is that this is a very ecstatic vessel. I yeah. mean, we're sizing it visually to the biggest segments, which are not normal segments; they're disease segments. It's okay, okay. Um, and I think we have to be careful no, about OCT. not oversizing in this situation. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so because the original stent was only three five, and I think you see that even distal to it, uh, the vessel is at least yeah, a four I, five at best, I, and I five zero oh, approximately. So I, I, I agree with you, but I think uh, what these guys are doing now, what are you doing? So now I'm going to go ahead with magic, with, with magic Touch. And this is part of a study of a protocol. We have to image at the end. So we're going to do an OCT at the end. But I agree. Probably in my my day-to-day -day life here, my practice, I would do an OCT before I go ahead with the balloon because the balloon should be the final touch, really just to deliver the drug. And this is, a again, a 4-0 Magic Touch. And now it's just to massage and to deliver drug. We, we should wait at least one minute. And meanwhile, I think that uh, we can show perhaps one or two slides about this technology for those of you who are not very aware. I think the Roxana is very aware because she's uh, been doing a couple of studies with a company called Concept Medical. And uh, this is the, the picture of the device. It's really an interesting technology. We all know that uh, 
to be able to release drug to the vessel wall with sirolimus is not an easy task. That's why we saw so many paclitaxel eluting balloons in the past and not sirolimus. Sirolimus is a kind of novelty. And I think it comes to a very good moment that the whole paclitaxel eluting balloon results have been challenged and has been uh, interrogated. I think that you can make some comments about that. But not only that, I think the concept of a bioresorbo scaffold is always has also has been on pause. So I think that it's, a, it's an interesting technology for us to discuss. Particularly with Magic Touch, you, the, the company were able to encapsulate with a nanotechnology the molecules of sirolimus in a liposomic way with phospholipid, and then it transferred to the vessel wall. You see some electronic picture to see how homogeneous is the, the, the whole coating on the top of the balloon. And by doing that, you really can transfer a good amount of drug to the vessel wall. The Adventitia works as a reservoir and releases sirolimus over time with this nanotechnology. So I think it's, it's really interesting, and we do see biological effect. I think uh, Jose did uh, a lot of imaging analysis. Okay, one minute. Next slide, please. And he, he can share with you some of the data that we generated from a first man ISR study here in Brazil with Magic Touch. Yeah, we, we ran a small registry here with 30 uh, patients with ISR, mostly from uh, second generation drug eluting stents. And we brought these patients for invasive follow up as part of the trial. And what we observe is that at the end of uh, one year, there was no binary restenosis. Late lumen loss by QCA was about 0.3. And by IVUS, 20% uh, of lumen obstruction in the case that we did. So that's actually qu quite well, good. Very interesting. Very and good. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, as you said, the serolimus technology and uh, having serolimus now is, a, is an interesting uh, can you explain to us a little bit more about why um, the, the encapsulation of this drug, how it makes it uh, uh, easy for uh, elution and, uh, and different than other uh, drug, uh, drug coated balloons? Yeah, so that's what I mentioned. I think that the, the, they were able to really encapsulate the drug in this phospholipid uh, material. And, uh, and phospholipid will be much more lipophilic and can really be transferred to the vessel wall. <laughs> and then at the, in the vessel wall, you, the, the whole nanoparticle will be released slowly. Right, Jose? According to the, uh, the studies that were run by Dr. Vimani lab, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the sirolimus is detected at the wall uh, of the vessel after the uh, deployment of, of the, the inflation of the balloon. So it has a lot of retention of the drug. What is not usually uh, found with uh, limus drugs when they are used without yeah. polymers. And, and I believe there is like one or two more companies that are working with Cirolimus. Uh The other one is going to be Med Alliance with a solution that they have some interesting data as well, recently presented at TCT. And there is an additional, another third company that also is working, it's called Orchid. Yep. So those are the three, and uh, the ones that we have more experience is really uh, with Magic Touch. Okay, Looks so like you're going to do an OCT. I'd like to hear about the experience of how, how you're all uh, treating ISR in Europe. Uh, with, are you still using uh, Paclitaxel coated balloons? Uh, so let's start with uh, Pascal, and then uh, Marco, and Peter. Um, yes. But I have a question also for Alexander. Alexander, uh, you were speaking about the lipophilic profile of the drug or drug delivery. Uh, what about calcification? Uh, does it matter uh, if you have a, a characteristics of the balloon like this? Yeah, so I had the same discussion with, uh, with Renu and with Alok, Alok Fien, regarding calcification. And, and even regarding, you know, some fibrotic tissue that... Uh, we, we find sometimes in ISR re lesion. So I think that's why the recommendation before we go ahead with uh, a DCB is generally to, call, to use a scoring balloon to be able to break the lesion and to help this, uh, this uh, break, let's say these fractures of the plaque really helps the penetration of drug to the vessel wall. So extremely high calcified vessel that you don't break the calcium before, you are right, Tamar, you can work as a shield to uh, prevent the penetration of drug to the vessel wall. 
But Which fortunately, we learned that we have to do a good job before we go ahead with the CP, right, uh, Ibrahim? Well, it's not surprising. I mean, calcium. Yeah, that was Pascal with the smart question, but let's go to Marco. Marco? Well, I agree. I think I will try to use a damp in this case in Europe. Uh, Packet taxi losing balloon is available. The question for Alex and Eber Grube, they are expert in technology, that I am actually wondering is whether a late loss assessment six months is already telling you the long term results or whether you would probably need to add that assessment also a little bit later down the road? It's a good question. Okay. We're, okay. We're, it's six yeah. months. Is, are you happy with your six months point two nine yeah. late so, loss, or should so, you be uh, reviewing that? So longer? I think this is a fantastic question that is going to be answered in exactly five minutes, in because next, next door <laughs> we have a one-year follow-up of uh, this technology to show you. See, we are so, provisioning what you were talking about. <laughs> so we will discuss about that momentarily. But uh, <laughs> now I want to show you the final results of uh, the OCT. And uh, the Daniel, you will narrate uh, the OCT images. Yeah. So again, we have the 31 millimeter segment. And as you can appreciate, the distal segment wasn't touched by the balloon. And you don't see much damage to the intimal oh. layer here. And I'm, I'm at, at the exact small lumen area, which shifted from the proximal segment to this distal segment here, which is about 5.4, 5.5 um, square millimeters. Okay and uh, a significant improvement in the proximal part. And this is the region where we had the focal ISR. And as I move, you will see some dissections. And you also can see the cuttings from the cutting balloon in some of the regions, like here. So a nice opening. And the area here is about 10 square millimeters in size. And you can see also that the stent area now has improved. I didn't measure but it's visible that the stent has increased significantly. So there is a major improvement, not only in the compression of NIH, but also in the expansion of the, of the device. So we don't see those areas of... Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Rasha has a yeah, question. Yeah, I'm yeah. just going to ask. It. I mean, it's a fantastic OCT result, and obviously we treated that focal area. I wonder whether there's an indication here for doing post-PCR physiology because there is still quite a lot of diffuse disease and we see this NIH in the rest of the stent. And I just wonder, hopefully we've got ischemic resolution, but you know, it's possible that we may not. Okay, this might sure. be a good, good, good opportunity to reuse QFR yeah. Uh, yeah. rather than putting another yeah. wire Yeah, down. potentially, absolutely. Yeah, what we can do is just no. process well, QFR. Uh, if you think it through, huh? What, what we can just process okay. QFR and we know that it has, at the moment, a, a broad uh, kind mm -hmm. of gray zone. So if we're still inside the gray zone, then we definitely go for an invasive measurement. But if it's pretty negative, so we can just conclude with that and, and, and accept these nice anatomical results. Roxanne, I think we should just take a look at the final angel because Alex already moved it to the other room to show yes, the one-year follow-up. Yes, we need to follow. go to the other room. Yeah. Yes, so we're ready. Just put no, the angel on the screen, please. Points. Thank you, Roxanne. That's a good point. We're only seeing you, no, no angel. Oh, please, the angel, William, on the screen, please. Angiography on the screen. We still can't see the angel. Okay, that's the angel. That's the final picture without the wire. They left the Looks oblique. Great. We did two projections. Of course, it's not, you know, it looks great. It's, it's uh, 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 you know, ang angiographically looks great. We know there's not another layer of stent. Uh, the, the, and the, the drug has been delivered and the truthful be in follow-up. And it's beautiful, beautiful case. And I do think that it looks, it looks nice. And I don't know if you're going to do QFR on this, but I'm very satisfied. Any other points? We can go to your other room. Yeah, Thank we can you. move to the Thank next you, room. Jose. Thank you, doctor. Now we are in lab three, Roxana. Can Hello. you hear? Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you, but we see Jose. Now you can see okay, us. Okay, now we are. Here uh, you guys are. I'm, yes, uh, yes. I, we I, only have 20 minutes, so we'll, we will not talk too much. We'll I, let you do work. I don't. I don't think we we need much more than that. Uh, again, with uh, my good friend here, Ebahar, my brother. And uh, Fernando uh, is that our attendees here. And uh, Dimitri Siqueira, you met him before. He will present us the case. And Luis, 
is uh, our junior interventionalist, a great team here uh, in uh, Lab 3 to help us to conduct this case. Technicians and nurses extremely helpful at here at So Dimitri, can go, we go ahead and present? Okay, Alex, thank you. So good morning to San Francisco. It's my pleasure to present our next case. May I have the first slide, please? This is a 78-year-old gentleman, 58. Say, 58, sorry, same age of the, the previous patient, yes. coincidentally. So uh, she, she, yeah, he I has... it was the same patient again. Yeah, it seems like a, the same patient. So uh, he has hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, COPD, and he presented uh, back in 2015 with uh, myocardial infarction, and he was treated with the PCI with the uh, Everolimus eluting stent to the RCA. And three years after, uh, last year actually, uh, he has a recurrent angina and due to a focal uh, incident ricinosis. And he underwent a PCI with a drug eluting balloon, the magic touch. Uh, and we're gonna show you the images from the previous angiography. So next slide. So he has no significant disease on the left coronary artery. Next. Next, please. The LV function was normal at that time. And you can see that in the right, the focal restenosis of the stent previously implanted on the mid RCA. So next. As part of the protocol, this patient was treated with a drug eluding balloon, 3.0. And on the right, uh, you can see the result of the intervention uh, back in September uh, 2018. Next. So in summary, now this patient is uh, asymptomatic and we're gonna do uh, a 12 month uh, follow-up with angiography and intravascular imaging. So maybe we, we can show you the angiography that's, that we just did uh, before. Can we show the fluoro please? So this patient, Roxana, was part of the protocol that uh, Ribamar just showed you. So we implanted, uh, we treated this yeah. patient so, back so one year ago. Before you show us the angiogram, yes. Before you show us the angiogram, he, I, gonna... I wondered, uh, did you do exactly, did you do exactly what you did in the other room with uh, with the imaging of the right coronary artery uh, and diagnosing? Uh, Exactly. What that ISR was about. Was it an underexpanded stent? Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that before you show us the follow-up? Yes. So uh, this is the follow-up. But before we show that, uh, we we do of course guided by imaging, and uh, what we saw uh, one year ago was a combination again, a little bit of underexpanded stent, a little bit less than what you saw today, what you saw previously, because this is a relatively smaller vessel. So this is a a 3.0 vessel, not a, a 4.5 vessel. So there was a little bit of a combination of also underexpanded uh, previous stent, but, uh, but a lot of intima hyperplasia, but focal. So we, we selected this patient from our database of the study patients that we treated here, just because it really mimics uh, what we did, just did acutely in lab four. So just uh, to answer to Mark's question, what is, uh, what is this uh, lesion would lo look like one year later? And Dimitri just did some shots, and you see the, the follow-up at the RCA. I think it's perfect. You hardly cannot identify, right, Ebahar, yeah. where the lesion was. So I'm, I'm very happy with this very long-term result, one-year result. You see this was in the, I don't know if you can see where the stent was. Take the contrast out, Dimitri. So they, you see mm -hmm. the stand? Mm -hmm. So there is, there is nothing. It. Yeah. So I think that uh, we're going to go ahead now and, okay. show, yeah, and show the, the OCT images. I think that Danielle can uh, share with us uh, the OCT images. Can you, can you uh, please, can you switch to Danielle to the OCT images? So by, uh, by angiography, you can really appreciate a very good long-term result. Danielle, can you go ahead and describe the sure. OCT of this patient? Can we have the OCT uh, on screen, please? So what does everyone think we're going to see? OCT in the big screen, please. Uh, yeah. So you'll see that the stent, the distal edge, is close to this acute marginal branch. 
And as we come to the stand, you realize that, number one, there is very, very small NIH, very thin, very smooth. And the other thing is, if you look at the characteristic of this tissue here, in contrast to the previous case, you see that this new intimal tissue is much more homogeneous, bright, as we expect for a normal fibrotic neo intimal hyperplasia. There is some calcification behind stent, which, is, which was the original plaque behind, but nothing inside. There is no new atherosclerosis, no calcification, no inflammation. This is a pretty much normal NIH as we expect for a good drug eluting stent, or in this case, one year after a drug eluting balloon. The minimal lumen area inside the stent segment is 4.2, which gives us a very, very small stent uh, percent area stenosis of about 15% as compared to the average of the distal and proximal reference. So this is nice to, s to see the, the difference in quality as compared to the previous one, the new atherosclerosis one. This is what we expect for a normal or an effective and safe DES or DEB. You like the result, Rox? I, I think, uh, oh, it's incredible, but uh, I don't want to be, so Rasa, yeah, Hector, gonna, uh, a, Dr. Gaspar, anybody? I was going to say it's a great result, but I was just going to play devil's advocate. Obviously, you bet, bring this patient back for angiographic follow-up as part of the trial. Then if you see restenosis and this patient is potentially asymptomatic, what, do you, what have you guys been doing if you see significant restenosis? Do you treat it anyway, or do you base it on symptoms? Do you do physiology? You know, what do you do next? You, well, if I see a patient with a failure of a DCB it, with a single stent implanted before, my trend is to use another DES. What about you? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I feel the same way. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think Rasha was uh, pointing towards whether or not yeah. if the patient is totally asymptomatic. I'd be very surprised that... Uh, that a patient who has presented with symptoms before may be completely asymptomatic. But I guess we've seen this before, haven't we, where we bring patients back for angiographic follow-up and we're, our tendency is to want to treat because right, we've but, done the angiogram. Yeah. That's right, but um, I'm no, sure absolutely. that they would use some kind of a physiology yeah, that, guidance that, that, yeah, and things yeah. like that. I, but, uh, but I fully agree, and, and I think that's an important one. But what, 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 what uh, the big answer to the question is for drug eluding or drug coded failure, uh, repeat stenting would be, and I think that's another reason why I think it's so important to have this technology instead of putting another layer right away. You want to yes. just give it, give the balloon, drug coated balloon a chance, and then if that fails, you can go to another layer of stenting. So, anyway, so what does the QFR show? Very good results. Look at that. Yes. Are you happy with that? Um, so, so, yeah, so just fantastic. to illustrate, uh, <laughs> uh, not only yeah, the Anna. Not only the anatomy, <laughs> but also <laughs> physiology. I, we thought it would be interesting to show the QFR for and this patient. It's interesting I think to see Danielle can describe. Where, where you see lesion one, you see that the delta QFR is zero. So that's the segment that, where we have the stent length. So there is no gradient inside the stent. If you assume that there is no crosstalk between lesions or segments in QFR, which is taken at rest, um, and the distal vessel QFR is 0.97, so pretty normal. And this rush would be a case that for sure we wouldn't bother to go with an invasive wire, as opposed to the other one, I agree that we should confirm with an invasive wire, but this one just reassures that there is nothing left to do in this case. Yeah, so this was also a beautiful demonstration for us to relax that anatomically and physiologically this patient is doing well. But I absolutely agree with, uh, with your comments that in a patient that I treated with uh, even DCB or, or DS, if the patient is asymptomatic, I wouldn't uh, recommend invasive angiography just due to the ocular stenotic effect. But in this particular patient, it's part of the protocol. So we would invite him anyway for a long-term invasive uh, evaluation because if it's part of the study. And it, it served as well because I think it illustrated what we did acutely next door what this patient potentially could look uh, 12 months. Of course, it's a single patient, but uh, we, when we have 30, 40 or more patients, we start to believe that there is really a biological effect of DCB with Sirolimus to the vessel wall because the data is consistent. So I'm very uh, enthusiastic about and, this and new and option. And I can tell you how important the work that you have done in Dante Pazanese has been with this Thanks. consistent and persistence in bringing these patients back 
using intravascular imaging, physiology, uh, giving us a biological understanding of how these new devices are, uh, are acting within the vessel wall. And it has been the reason why you're the mecca and the beginnings of a lot of the first in man studies as well as evaluation of new technology and why DES started all there, right down there in Brazil. We congratulate what you and your colleagues do and continue to do to help us understand mechanistically what's going on. This has really been one of the most, most uh, uh, thoughtful uh, transmissions to bring a, a, a patient with ISR, show us the acute results, and then have a, almost a mirror patient next door um, with the exact same age, <laughs> <laughs> right, coronary artery and uh, an imaging that uh, basically shows the mirror no, image. It's unbelievable, <laughs> right, Magnus? Yeah, uh, Could we do that in the U.S.? Can, can I yeah. ask, are they twins? Incredible, incredible work. So, so well, perhaps one final yeah, no, comment uh, from, from the experts there. I see that you and, and Marco are, are really great experts beyond uh, besides others on, on, on how do we treat these patients with dual antiplatelet therapy, I think it's a big question mark yet. If we have a patient that we treated with DCB, some of the guidelines will tell us three months. Part of this protocol, we said six months, but what are your thoughts about the pro the, the, how long we should give uh, this, the, the APT? So Marco is the chair of the guidelines, and I'm glad to bring that right over to you, Marco Valdemick, the <laughs> chair of the guidelines for European society. Thank you, Roxana. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> that is not a nice question because, in fact, we don't have any data there. <laughs> the American guidelines are silent. The European guidelines are saying in the lack of data, do what you would do anyhow, meaning risk stratify the patient for ischemic and bathing risk. That's what I would do, honestly. I would at least go for one or two months the APT, even if we actually don't, don't, don't have evidence that you would need the APT, perhaps a P2 Y12 inhibitor, if you allow a sort of a twilight approach maybe also the way to go in the future. And I guess that would be, from my side, a call for dedicated studies there. So, Marco, when Dr. you, when, uh, when you, uh, Dr. Uh, look, Omen? When, when uh, you look into has the, a, has a comment. In, 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 into the treatment. Well, I, I would just say we finished a twilight oh. study. Did we not learn something Wait from on. that? It ah. seems to me that that ought to be the way of the future. That's yeah, well, thank you. Take. Thank you, that's really nice. Um, I think so, but I'm not, to say that. So, Eberhardt, what did you want to say? I, no, I was going to say, um, it, yeah, when, when, you, when you think about two things, um, you know, we've been around at the DES area with, with Paclitaxel. Uh, nobody thought that Sirolimus was a good drug in order to do that for uh, its lipophilicity and, and things like that. And now we're really getting into the, the next, uh, next generation situation where uh, it came at the right time with the, with the Paclitaxel discussion now. Um, I think we have a very valuable alternative to, to treat, uh, um, uh, you know, to treat a disease that you know, previously wasn't so easy to be treated. And I think it is very clear that the lesion preparation, that, that's what we have learned. The lesion preparation is fundamentally important in order to, uh, to get a good result with a, with a drug-looting balloon now using uh, serolimus. The other thing that I was going to mention, you know, it's a little bit like since we don't have any data, um, <clears throat> wouldn't you think that a three month uh, would be a little bit more appropriate just to be on the safe side and always provided that the patient doesn't have any bleeding problems or any other problems? Um, I just would be, you know, be, be, be careful just to take the minimum uh, of one month and, 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 and get over to, to three months. You know, especially in that first patient where we saw some neoatherosclerosis and uh, macrophages, et cetera, right. and I think it's an interesting comment. I just hope that as we bring uh, this technology forth, that we do as good a job as we always do and continue to really study the duration of dual antiplatelet right. therapy correctly and understand the different durations. And, uh, and I agree with you. I don't think we know what we're doing. Perhaps we should study it going forward. Uh, Marco, final comment before we go? Well, I think I actually agree with Everett. I think the comment was very well taken. The bleeding risk of this patient is very low. Yeah. And this patient is a post-MI patient, so I think there is no reason for shortening DBT. 
Of course, we are very guided by what we do in the cath lab, but we mm -hmm. should not forget that EPT is a secondary prevention so, measure. So this is actually, not to really tout the twilight study, this is actually a perfect patient for uh, this type of a thing. It's, a, it's a, a patient who is rich in thrombotic risk. We want to minimize uh, bleeding. We want to be able to give a potent agent as long as we can. He's had a prior MI. Uh, why not give Ticagrelor an aspirin for three months and then uh, stop the aspirin and move forward with Ticagrelor to protect him against ischemic complications down the line, as we've seen in Pegasus and other important studies. So, Rob, any idea when, when the U.S. <laughs> or the FDA, for that matter, when the, when, when the, 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 the drug loading balloons entered the United States? Good any, question. Any thoughts? I mean, I think this is a really, really important question. We see how uh, important they are in treatment of these patients with ISR. Why put, I mean, that, especially the one you just, this, this right coronary is a small right coronary artery. Putting in a second and third layer of stent is just not the right thing to do. Yeah. And here you gave this patient the right to have a, a, a therapy that worked for the last 12 months. It looks beautiful and there's not a second layer of a stent. We don't have that available in the un United States, but there are several um, uh, now uh, breakthrough technologies that have come through, and I'm proud to say that this particular technology has been granted that kind of a breakthrough technology because of the Sirolimus, um, uh, uh delivery and the fact that it is a needed, uh, needed uh, technology to come in both for periphery and hopefully for the coronary. So we look forward to that uh, and bringing this technology over. Dr. Sophie, yeah, last comment. Yeah. Alex, uh, uh, congratulations for this case. This magic touch can be used for uh, osteal lesion diffuse disease as well. You have a study about this? About for, for what? For a small lesion? Also can be for lesion. Lesion. For osteal lesion. For osteal lesion. Yes. Osteal so, lesion diffuse disease. So, so right now, um, um, Mohamed uh, Kifak, by the way, uh, thank you for your comments. Shukran. Uh, the, 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 your comment goes uh, for if your comment goes for side branch uh, diagonals. Yes, we do have a lot of data for yeah. bifurcation for side branch. Uh, we also have data for a small <coughs> vessel, but aorta osteo lesions. No, I think that uh, it's not going to be a, my first choice. We have more fibrotic, a lot of calcium in, in a big vessel. I think that the way to go is to deploy a stent. Even if I have an ISR there, probably, I would do a second stent. But for a small vessel, side branch, when you have osteo lesion in, in diagonals, I think this, this technology would be fantastic.